Hey everybody, it's the Board Game Blogger. Today I'm here to review To The Last Man. This is a fantastic uh, Western Front uh, World War I game put out by Nuts Publishing, uh, designed by Tim Taylor. And it is really a lot of fun. Um, plays quick. You can probably play the full game once you know it. Um, you know, in three to three and a half hours, kind of depending how much AP each player has. The game can end uh, much quicker as well if, you know, um, you decide to call it at that point. But what's really neat is this this game really uh, does a good job of simulating, you know, trench uh, warfare, of simulating, you know, the First World War. Some, some games, like, they're a little bit more generic, you know, and you feel like I'm playing this, I could substitute this for another, you know, battle, a different war doesn't seem that unique here. They do a really good job of, of faithfully making it, you know, Western Front uh, World War I. Components are kind of hit and miss. Some of them are really good and some of them are kind of poor. Now this is kind of a, a card driven system. It's not like a CDG in the, the Mark Herman We the People style, but it's a CDG in kind of a more, you know, 1775, 1812 style because you you have cards that you're going to play basically to either you know move your units start a battle um, to play to kind of enhance the battle like a surprise attack poison gas advanced artillery or um, as replacement cards to you know you play them and you don't actually you lose units on the board it's like you're rushing in replacements um, troops um, the Artwork on the cards is fantastic. You know, you're going to have some of the cards are the same. There's lots of offensive cards. Each picture is different. It's beautiful. Really good graphic design on the cards, on the map. Um, you've got the core rule book. It's well written, um, well laid out. Um, it's this is a French publisher, uh, so sometimes you know, not sure of how well things are translated. It is an American designer though and it is, uh, it's done well. Things are well laid out. This is kind of the core rule book. Then you've got the, the theater rule book. Um, table of contents on the back. There is no index, unfortunately. Um, I don't know why you're not having indexes. Especially here, you've got 16 pages in the core rule book, 24 in the, the theater rule book. To have an index would have been a lot more helpful. So the theater rule book has some advanced rules. A lot of them I highly recommend you play with, and the designer does as well. I think this game really shines when you have a fog of war aspect. And you're going to see uh, when I turn to the map, you've got armies on the board, um, and then you've got kind of like an army card off to the side that will have, you know, basically what makes up the army. And when the game gets interesting is when you've got a fog of war aspect there. So it's like, oh, I don't know how strong the fourth army is, you know. Has he transferred troops? Has he transferred an artillery? That's when it gets really interesting. Um, and I think this game should have come with privacy screens so you could play that uh, you know, much more accessibly. Here now you've got to basically get privacy screens from a different game you've got or you know, use the box cover to try to you know, block um, things out. Um, you know, this is a 65 euro game they really could have included some privacy screens at that price. Um, you've got some excellent player aids. Um, they're well done. Um, you know, it's not cheap um, paper or anything. It's, it's a solid player aid. Uh, the map uh, looks beautiful. Really good graphic design. This is one of the best games uh, I've seen for graphic design. Um, you know, top five games of all time for graphic design. Everything looks beautiful, um, but unfortunately the map, it's just thin paper map, it's not mounted. Uh, I mean, when you're paying 65 euro for a game, you should be getting a mounted map. I know some people out there seem to have some weird hate of mounted maps, um, but then, you know, you include both a paper and a mounted map. Um, this game plays quick, it's not one of those, you know, grognard, you know, 20 hour games where, yeah, okay, let's do a paper map, because those are the only kind of people who play it. If you've got a game that plays in under five hours, 
it's an evening game, you need to make it more accessible to the public, um, and you've got to include a mounted map. Um, I, I know it's not a huge print run, it's a French publisher, um, 65 euro, and not many distributors. I picked this up from uh, Noble Knight, who seemed to be the only American uh, store. Um, and they had it on sale for about $80, $85. Um, so it's, it's pretty pricey, but uh, the gameplay is fantastic. Um, my only two components concerns, besides the, the lack of index, which far too many games have, so it's not really a specific critique against this company when all of them do it, but is they need to include some privacy screens uh, to just enhance the fog of war aspect. That that's how this game gets a lot of fun, and to have a mounted map, um, it's just inexcusable to have a 65 euro game and to not have a mounted map. Um, but I'm sure you want to see sort of how it plays, how this really is good at simulating the trench warfare. Um, it's just it's really a fantastic game. Um, but let's take a look at it now. So right now I've got it set up on a traditional uh, 1914 setup. What's really neat about this game is just sort of the replayability. You've got here several, uh, you know, different start scenarios, 1914, 15, 16, 17, 18, and then a hypothetical 1919 plan. But where it really shines is the variant uh, plans to start up in 1914. And so you can go on, you know, Von Moltke, the Elder's plan, uh, von Schlieflin's uh, first plan, Kaiser Williams' plan, and then also uh, the French have different plans, you know, plan 14, plan 15, 15B, plan 16, uh, 16B, of course they're, the one they actually executed was plan 17, and so that's what's really neat here is just the the replayability and the variability in, in setting up this game. And you can see here we've got, you know, uh, different army units um, and you have forts. So here we have an actual army which is uh, off board here. Now this would be hidden from the other player. So here, you know, we would have this typically hidden um, from the opposing player. So I've just, for review purposes separated uh, the Germans from the French and uh, the British and the Belgian army. Um, now one thing, the way the game simulates initiative is basically your hand size. So the Germans at the beginning of the game uh, in a traditional setup have 15 cards to the uh, Entente's 8 and uh, Throughout the rest of the game, the Germans are always going to maintain a hand size of 8, uh, whereas the Entente has, starts with 4 cards um, the first year, and then it slowly moves up, 15 cards, 6 cards. Finally, when the Americans come in, um, 1919, they're going to be at 9 cards if, if the game goes so long. Now, if we zoom in here, we can also see some... Uh, interesting features. We've got this red triangle that's going to demark that it's difficult terrain and the defender will take one less casualty um, inflicted um, in a battle there. We have this one that's a victory point. Now the Germans are going to start with 11 victory points um, which starts the game at a, a stalemate just closer to the Entente victory side than to the German and the uh, marker will shift throughout the game. Now, uh, you know, starts summer 1914 and uh, we have sort of events listed on the, the map, um, you know, when uh, full entrenchment can occur, when poison gas becomes available, those types of things. And it's not something you can research to the side, it just comes in at a certain year. Um, so in, in some sense, some of the things are abstract. Here is sort of the player uh, turn, how it works. You're going to have uh, reinforcements, going to check the, the season track, and if uh, any reinforcements come in. And then the German player is going to start, and they can play a card, um, and move their units 
uh, announce battles and conduct them, or they can choose to pass. You have sort of the order that battles occur in, and then uh, the Entente player will go. And this will go back and forth until both players choose to pass. We then go to the production phase where supply is checked, and then we advance the turn marker. Now supply, um, sort of countries here on the border, or regions rather, um, with this symbol denotes supply. Um, if you're, and you can trace supply through a uh, friendly territory or a disputed territory which has both uh, units in it, supply can't be traced through, but the units in there itself are considered to be in supply. So why don't I just kind of do a turn or two, you can kind of see how uh, play works here. So this is the German player's hand. Now there's certain cards here, such as uh, Poison Gas. Now this is a misprint, unfortunately. All the Poison Gas cards uh, say that it's available in Spring 1917. This should of course be Spring 1915. Um, there are a few errors like that. Uh, there's an Entente Military Crisis. I could play this for an event once it's 1915 and because of the crisis um, in the Near East. Um, Gallipoli, uh, they're going to have to remove one uh, United Kingdom infantry from the game. Um, there are these offensive cards, uh, limited offensive, which is similar to an offensive, allowing all units to move, but then may only initiate one battle. So why don't we um, just kind of show how one turn works here. Furthermore, here you've got uh, different production. As you can see here, this is an advanced rule. Um, normally in the game, you have sort of default uh, production points. So the um, Entente is going to start with six, the Germans with five, and it slowly ramps up throughout the game. Um, and then different regions, we see here Paris, has a factory symbol. If they lose, uh, if one side loses, uh, region with the factory symbol, they're going to lose production there, and um, the side that's captured it can attempt to basically rebuild that production and then gain more production that way. Um, one of the things, I think, in addition to just a paper map, which is not helpful, um, you know, I really wish there was a map, map, I also wish there were sort of tokens you could lay um, for as you change the game to show, oh, this is now controlled and is only friendly to either the Germans or to the Entente. Um, you basically just have to kind of remember where the uh, forces have gone through because there aren't tokens to lay down. Again, that's kind of a minor complaint, but uh, given the price tag on this game, which is rather high, this game should have come with a, a few other things, such as the uh, tokens to show ownership when it's not the default. Um, the mounted map board and then privacy screens to to hide. Um, but it's it's really kind of a neat system. Now uh, you know starts summer 1914 and uh, we have sort of events listed on the the map. Um, you know when uh, full entrenchment can occur, or when poison gas becomes available those types of things. and It's not something you can research to the side, it just comes in at a certain year. Um, so in some sense some of the things are abstract. Here is sort of the player uh, turn, how it works. You're going to have uh, reinforcements, going to check the the season track and if uh, any reinforcements come in. And the German player is going to start and they can play a card um, and move their units uh, announce battles and conduct them, or they can choose to pass. You have sort of the order that battles occur in, and then uh, the Entente player will go. And this will go back and forth until both players choose to pass. We then go to the production phase where supply is checked, and then we advance the turn marker. Now supply, um, sort of countries here on the border, or regions rather, um, with this symbol denotes supply. Um, if you're and you can trace supply through a uh, friendly territory or a disputed territory which has both uh, units in it. Supply can't be traced through, but the units in there itself are considered to be in supply. So why don't I just kind of 
do a turn or two, you can kind of see how uh, play works here. So this is the German player's hand. Now there's certain cards here, such as uh, Poison Gas. Now this is a misprint, unfortunately. All the Poison Gas cards uh, say that it's available in Spring 1917. This should, of course, be Spring 1915. Um, there are a few errors like that. Uh, there's an Entente Military Crisis. I could play this for an event once it's 1915, and because of the crisis um, in the Near East, um, Gallipoli, uh, they're going to have to remove one uh, United Kingdom infantry from the game. Um, there are these offensive cards, uh, limited offensive, which is similar to an offensive, allowing all units to move, but then may only initiate one battle. So why don't we um, just kind of show how one turn works here. So the, the Germans will choose to play their offensive card, allowing uh, all units to move and can initiate battles uh, basically as many as they want. So here, what's going to happen is the German uh, first, second, and third armies in Aachen are going to move into Liege. Now there's a hard limit of three units per side uh, stacking. And now there is an exception for forts that won't include the stacking limit. But and by unit it means either just an individual unit here or an army. So by using armies, you can obviously uh, stack a lot more units in a, a region. So in addition uh, to moving and conducting that battle, the Germans can move all their other units. They're going to move the fourth and fifth armies here into Luxembourg. Um, and I think they're going to keep their other armies here in uh, Alsace-Lorraine. So that will be their movement in action. Now what's going to happen will be uh, the battle. So what would happen normally is you're going to move out of your privacy screen, kind of reveal we've got the first, third, and second armies. Now uh, combat works is the artillery is going to fire first, then the defender fires, and then the uh, attacker will fire the rest of his units and will fire artillery again. So artillery is pretty powerful in that it can do the initial barrage and then uh, will also fire again during the main attack. So what's going to happen is the German player has two artillery. Now there's a stacking limit for artillery per army. In 1914 you can only ever have one artillery per army. Um, and that's sort of demarked here. There is a siege gun as well. Um, which can only be used against forts. Um, but here in Liege, that's all that the Entente uh, player has, one fort. So we're now going to roll two dice. Now artillery without uh, any modifiers only hit on a one. Um, so they may not hit here. We roll, we have one hit. At this point, the Entente player can choose to either take the hit and reduce the fort uh, one step, or he can play a card. So he's got these cards in his hand, his eight cards, and he can always play a card as if it's an Arats one. Now that means to basically just reduce the losses. Now he's going to have to play a card here in this first stage. So even if he has an Arats two, it, it would be wasteful to play it um, during this artillery barrage, because the extra one's not going to carry over into the main uh, German attack here. Um, but he's going to choose to play a poison gas card. It's not worth anything until spring 1915 anyway. So you can play it as an Arats one to basically absorb the hit. So that's played, reduces the on top player's hand from eight down to seven. Um, but he doesn't actually lose a step. Now the fort will fire. And forts are quite good here because they can hit on a two or less. So much greater chance of uh, doing some damage here on the German player. And it's a level three fort. So it's going to roll three dice, uh, resulting in two hits. The German player here can either take hits 
on his army. If he chooses that, it's got to be the largest army, which would be either the first or second. So he could choose which one. He could not take it on the third army. And then it would have to be the largest group of a type of unit here. So he couldn't lose an artillery, a siege gun, or cavalry. He would have to lose uh, an infantry. But uh, as luck would have it, um, German player has an Arats 2 card. He will play that to absorb the two losses instead. It's kind of like uh, rushing in replacements. Um, now, the German player will get to fire here. Cavalry do not attack unless it's uh, involved in a, a retreat. They can fire on defense, but they never fire on attack. They have a pursuit role if the opposing player chooses to retreat. But here, the artillery are fire at ones along with the infantry. So they actually have 15 dice rolls here. Um, so if three, it's nothing. Only hit on ones. That's one hit. And two. So I have two hits plus the siege gun will fire. The siege gun only damages a fort, um, but it will hit on a three or less. And a three. So that is three hits total. And the uh, on top player is going to choose, rather than playing an Arats card, will actually lose the fort. So that's three hits total. That was all that uh, this fort had. It was three. It's a step loss and will go down. Um, if it had done less damage. But that's enough, and they take Liege, the Germans. It's no longer a disputed area. It's now friendly only to the German player, and it's considered enemy to uh, the Entente player. If, however, they'd only, say, degraded uh, it down to a level one, and that this remained on the board, then it's a disputed uh, territory. And both units inside could still trace supply, but the supply can't go through that. But now that this is now German friendly territory, I would really have liked it had there been you know, a marker to place down to show, oh, that's now uh, German controlled. And they don't have to keep a unit in there, but uh, it's now friendly. So if they all move out basically until the Entente player uh, retakes it, it's going to remain German friendly. And again, uh, a few minor components issues um, kind of hold back the game. But now it's the uh, Entente player's turn. These would go back behind the privacy screen, um, would not be visible. And the Entente player could uh, counter. Um, but let's say the Entente player decides, oh, I don't want to really move all that many units. Uh, I can pass, not play a card, save them for later, and that will allow me to move one unit. Um, so I could move any one unit. There is rail movement here, so you can move from a friendly territory to another friendly territory um, up to three spaces. So you couldn't rail into battle. You can't, you know, rush into a disputed territory. And you clearly can't go to an enemy territory. There's also a special sea movement here for the Entente, which is they've got uh, an army and an infantry unit up there in uh, England. And the way sea movement works is you have to move from a uh, England, basically, to a friendly territory. So you can't uh, send in troops to from England directly into a disputed or an enemy territory but they can move to uh, a friendly one that's on the coast. So they're going to choose to do that. They're going to move in the, the British uh, level one army. They will move it here into Antwerp and it's placed here in Antwerp. Now it was a pass. It would be the German player's turn again. He could choose to pass if he wanted and that would end uh, the season, so we'd basically advance to autumn. Now, the German player is not going to do that here with uh, still a lot of cards in his hand, and given the fact that he only has a hand limit of eight, it would cause a lot of discard in his hand. So he can continue to advance. He could play another 
offensive. And on an offensive, he can do as many battles as he wanted. So if he chooses to, he can move up, say, these armies here into Antwerp, initiate a battle there, as well as move, you know, these armies out of Luxembourg and attack Verdun. Now, what's neat here is this game is, you know, it's simulating um, the initial German attack because later on, and once uh, once winter hits, then uh, it's very easy to entrench. And when you're entrenched, infantry hit on a two or less, as opposed to just their normal one or less on the defense, whereas they're still only attacking uh, on a one, which is really, I think, a good way of simulating it. Later on in the game, you can build the sort of Hindenburg line. Um, and that style type of fortifications to really uh, bulk up the defense. I, I think it's just a really fun game. It's it's a quick game, uh, as you can see. You know we can play that quick, and the first turn is going to be the longest because then your hand size for cards and the uh, and what you can do is limited to eight at the most for the Germans. So there's kind of the initial big push in uh, summer. You know the guns of August. And then as uh, the war progresses, you know, you're more in kind of a, a stalemate type of action. Uh, to entrench, as I've mentioned it, you'd spend one of your production points and you could entrench up to four units. And a unit can be considered the entire army. Um, it's really a lot of fun when you've got this and you've got sort of privacy screens hiding um, your armies. So you really don't know the strength of an opposing army until you collide in battle, uh, it's it's really uh, interesting. There's a lot of tension, interesting decisions on where am I moving, where on the front do I want to send these troops. It's a fantastic game. I'd highly recommend getting it, um, except for, you know, the price tag. The price tag is pretty high, um, and it's, if this is something you're interested in, if you like the Western Front, um, if you like uh, World War One history, I think definitely rush out and get it. Um, otherwise, you're going to just basically have to wait is how much, you know, play time you're going to get out. It's it's an expensive game, and there are a few components issues. Some of the cards are misprinted, uh, only on the poison gas. Um, easy to remember, but there's no privacy screens. The map is not mounted. It's just a paper map, and there's no tokens uh, to show oh, I'm controlling a different territory, which you know, there really ought to have been. Um, but just a few minor components issues. I think the gameplay shines through. It's unique. It really simulates the uh, the Great War quite well without like bogging down into, you know, a hundred page rule book. It plays quick. You can play this game in an evening. Uh, this, this is a game that can get done in an evening. And I think given that fact, um, the fact you can even play it uh, beyond just a two-player game because uh, there are rules in here for basically division of the Entente player's powers. Uh, another thing that I, I've yet to go into, which I quite like, is that the game has uh, some optional rules for combat. So there's combat resolution, how I've described it. But then they also have uh, an average combat resolution to just kind of assume basically averages. I have this many infantry units. Um, I should get this many hits out of it and just kind of average it. Uh, some people don't like the dice and they think it can be way too swingy. So they have a rule system built in for that. Additionally, they have a D12 system built in, um, which is a has a little bit more depth and shows how things attack and hit. Uh, I think it's really interesting um, that they've they're aware of that there's different styles people like to play differently and they've built that in. There's a ton of replayability due to the alternate 1914 setups and you uh, you know a 1915, 16, 17, and so on setup. There's a lot of value here. It's an expensive game and there are a few minor components complaints, but it looks beautiful. It plays well, there's a ton of tension, and it's a game you can get done in the evening. I highly recommend it. Till next time.